expensive, with the Federal Reserve getting ready for the biggest bump to interest rates since Forrest Gump was in theaters. That means new loans, new mortgages, credit cards, they could all get more expensive. So we'll talk about President Biden's message today, plus dive into how gas prices are making seafood more expensive. And we got some breaking news on Capitol Hill today, with Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell suggesting he is comfortable with the bipartisan gun deal framework that's out there. We're going to read the tea leaves on whether that's an endorsement and what needs to happen to get this thing across the finish line. And WNBA star Brittany Griner will be detained in Russia even longer than expected. That news dropping while her team's here in Washington to put more pressure on the State Department, where they're feeling hopeful, coming up in the show. Plus, for tonight's original, we go inside a migrant shelter that's shutting down. Why the man in charge is demanding change from President Biden. And we'll take you behind the scenes of how one family lost their daughter to a drug overdose. And just how easy it can be to buy deadly drugs on social media. That's in the backstory a little later on in the show. Hey, I'm Hallie, and tonight President Biden wants you to know that he knows the economy is the biggest thing weighing on people's minds right now. That's why he was in Pennsylvania with union workers, testing his midterm pitch by blaming Republicans for not giving him a hand. Republicans in Congress are doing everything they can to stop my plans to bring down costs on ordinary families. That's why my plan is not finished and why the results aren't finished either. But here's the gut check. The economy doesn't seem to be working for Main Street or Wall Street right now with, look at this, a mixed bag for the markets. You've got the Dow down half a percent, the S&P and NASDAQ just about neutral after that big drop 24 hours ago. And look here, we're just learning today that wholesale prices, meaning what stores pay, is up nearly 11 percent since last year. Why is that important? Well, those costs are getting pushed onto us, contributing to the number on the other side of your screen, the record inflation rate. And guess what? Stuff's about to get even more expensive because now the Federal Reserve's planning to raise interest rates another three quarters of a point. That would be the biggest bump since Boys to Men had the biggest song in the country. Sweet 1994, folks. Kelly O'Donnell is outside the White House. Kelly, what's interesting here? And if you pull back big picture, I think a lot of Americans are asking, OK, recession. What's the deal? Are we going to enter into a recession? The CEO of Morgan Stanley says it's a 50-50 chance. I asked the president's top economic advisor about that just within the last couple hours. He said, no, 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 the word we should be using is not recession. It is transition. Explain that. Well, it's certainly a challenge for the Biden White House to look at where things are right now. And when it comes to uh, the discomfort that Americans are feeling, they're, what they're trying to say is there is some good in the economy, and at the same time, they recognize the pain. And so when the Federal Reserve is expected to take these steps, let me borrow your Forrest Gump analogy from the top of the show. Life is like a box of chocolates. Some that you pick are just what you wanted, and others, you kind of wish you could stick it back in the box and hope, uh, you, you know, your great aunt picks that one. Uh, the pain that comes from higher interest rates is also very real. It will increase uh, mortgage debt. It will increase when people are paying uh, for a car loan and credit cards and so forth. But it's intended to bring down some of the inflation pressures that exist right now. So that transition is about trying to get people from a point where the economy is so heated up to dialing it back a little bit, where the strength of the economy is still in place, but it's not so overheated. And that, they hope, will, will kind of even out and give people the strength of the economy working for them, but without the uh, rising prices that people are experiencing month upon month upon month that's really changing uh, their monthly budgets and seeing them having to spend a lot more for the same goods and services. Yeah. they were buying all along. Kelly, let me see your Forrest Gump analogy and raise you another, because he liked to run, we know, in that movie. And I think a lot of people are saying, why don't I just go on foot rather than in the car because of gas prices, right? There's this question of what more the president, what more the White House can do unilaterally, meaning on their own, to help the economic picture when it comes to things that affect people's budgets, like the cost of gas. We saw that just this afternoon, they're opening up 45 million barrels more crude oil from the strategic oil reserves. How much of a difference is that going to make? Like, like g give us the big picture on that front of what else they can do, what they have done so far to help people feel better when they do things like fill their tank. It's one of the few tools the president has directly at his power, and he has used it. They've been releasing a million barrels a day, and what you just referenced is another piece of 
putting new uh, barrels of oil released from that stockpile out on the marketplace to sell them in combination, trying to put more supply to reduce costs. It brings the price down a little, but the president mentioned today that the price of, of gas has gone up more than $1.75, he says, based on the war in Ukraine. So he's going against those pressures, using some of his authority, but the global marketplace is also really working against it. Hallie? Kelly, real quick, you know, the, the political pressure on the president is real here, too. There's not a good poll, an awesome poll for him right now when it comes to the economy. 83% of people say the economy is not doing well. His job approval rating has dropped to about 38%. His messaging hasn't changed much, though, Kel, no? That's one of the challenges for this White House. The president is sticking with some of the ideas that he believes would actually make things better for Americans by reducing some of the things they spend money on. Child care, uh, pharmacy bills like your, your prescription drugs or things that you would need that legislation could help with. But yeah. we know the legislation picture is not looking like that kind of a deal is going to come together. So the president's been sticking with that plan. At the same time, he is facing some real serious head wins in this midterm year. Kelly O'Donnell live for us there outside the White House tonight. Good to see you, Kelly. Thank you. So here's another example about how all of these cost increases are connected, right? Let's start with gas prices. We've talked about them a lot, but it's not just the price of a regular gallon of gas that you might fill up your car with. Diesel, mostly used for trucks and boats, that's way up to about $5.77 a gallon, almost two bucks more than this time last year. So those upfront costs, well, they're getting passed down to all of us, too, like with seafood. Fishermen have to pay more money to fill up their boats. It's driving up the cost you're paying, up about 12 percent since last year. Jake Ward is posted up at a marina just south of San Francisco. And, Jake, we're going to get to the fish in a second, right? But let me, let me start you off on the Fed here because this is an area that you know well. It seems like this three-quarter percent hike is a signal that they don't expect inflation to get better anytime soon. This is the best tack they have, they feel, to try to get a handle on that. Well, that's pretty much one of the only tactics they have, Hallie. I mean, the Fed, as you know, is officially only really able to do one of two things. It can either print more money or raise or lower interest rates. Those are, that's its whole arsenal. And so in this case, if it raises those interest rates too fast, it might slide us into a recession. That is, of course, the worry about uh, raising interest rates, uh, this expected three quarters of a percentage point. But if they acted too slowly, and many critics have acted, have said that they have acted too slowly, well, then, you know, we uh, are facing inflation. That's what we're looking at right now. And so you've heard President Biden earlier today talking about, you know, needing to bring down the cost of food, you know, and uh, the cost of fuel. And he said he'll do everything in his power. There really aren't that many levers to pull. And when it comes to the Fed, there's really just those two. Let's talk fishermen then. There you are. You're talking with folks there about fuel costs that are just one element of everything that is driving up seafood prices right now. That's right. It's fascinating to be in a place like this to see how closely aligned food and fuel prices really are. I mean, this place, Pillar Point Harbor, is essentially a, like a quick stop gas station for uh, uh, fisher people going up and down the Northern California coast. Some of these boats come from as far away as Seattle. The Polaris here came uh, hundreds of miles down from there. And the diesel engines on board these boats can burn anything from 6 to 20 gallons an hour. And at the prices they are paying here, over $6.60 per gallon gallon for diesel, they're blowing anywhere from 40 bucks to 120 bucks an hour just getting around. The fishing season here for salmon has been curtailed from about 100 days last year to only 48 days this year. So when we spoke to fishing captains here and asked, well, what do you do to compensate for all of this? Here's how they answered. Have a listen. We just take home less money is what it comes down to. And uh, the, few, the boats don't burn any less fuel. We're just, you know, dealing with um, the higher price of fuel the only way we know how, which is just spend more money. The 1.2 million people here in the fishing industry across the United States, they're really feeling this deeply and wondering what exactly the president can do for them, Holly. There are, listen, I don't want to be a total bummer of a newscast here, right? <laughs> because it, there's a lot of stuff that's tough for people to listen to when it comes to the economy. There are some bright spots, right? Kelly mentioned the unemployment rate, for example. There are some prices for stuff you buy that are set to go down, too. The Wall Street Journal is reporting that some stores like Target and Walmart and Macy's, they're finally getting some of these shipments of stuff we all wanted during the pandemic. And now they got like all these sweatpants, all these couches as people were looking to renovate and get comfy during COVID. And they're getting ready to, to put real big discounts on that because they got a, they got a lot now. 
That's absolutely right, Hallie. We're seeing now, uh, you know, Target said in its earnings call that it was going to be uh, cutting prices on many items. I mean, I think anything that takes up a lot of warehouse space is going to be something you'll see on sales starting beginning this summer. Uh, really, we've seen the predictive algorithms that these retailers depend on absolutely scrambled by the pandemic. The supply chain then scrambled it further. Now some of that is either unscrambling or leaving retailers with more than they can sell. So you're going to see steep discounts. It's the dysfunction of the pandemic that was working against us starting to work for us here, Hallie. Cheap sweatpants, Jake. Um, speaking my language. Thank you, sir. Good to see you. Appreciate you bringing us that news. Breaking news now, by the way, from Capitol Hill, where we are, with Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell saying he is comfortable with this framework deal that's been reached on changing the nation's gun laws, and he might even be willing to back this whole thing once it's actually written. Watch. For myself, I'm comfortable with the framework, and if the legislation ends up <coughs> reflecting what the framework uh, indicates, I'll be supportive. McConnell's support could really help the chances that this thing passes the Senate. And just as a quick reminder of what's actually in this deal, among other things, more incentives for states to have red flag laws, which let police or family members petition courts to keep guns away from people seen as a risk to themselves or to others. Saha Kapoor joins me now. All right. Gut check the significance here. Mitch McConnell coming out, not giving a thumbs down, and in fact saying he would be supportive if the text of the bill, right, the actual written format, matches the framework. That's right, Hallie. Well, I would say uh, Mitch McConnell's support in the 50-50 Senate tends to be a necessary, if not sufficient, uh, quotient, uh, an indicator for getting a, a bill over the finish line, getting at least 60 votes uh, to pass the Senate and ultimately make it to President Biden's desk. Uh, usually when he opposes a bill, there you don't find the 10 Senate Republicans who are willing to break away and support it. And the fact that he's willing to do this is very significant. He's only willing to do this uh, in large part because the political winds have shifted so much over the last decade that the, the uh, hunger for action in the American public is uh, so strong, stronger than it was uh, about 10 years years ago during that Sandy Hook Elementary School uh, massacre in Connecticut, after which Congress did not do anything uh, to act on gun violence. One uh, little bit of reporting I can share, Hallie, inside the meeting, Senator John Cornyn, the lead negotiator of this, presented to Senate Republicans behind closed doors a poll of a thousand gun owners, just gun owning households across the United States, and found overwhelming support for the provisions of this deal, including 79 percent support for red flag laws, 86 percent on closing the so-called boyfriend loophole, 80 Seven percent on including uh, juvenile records in the background check system. The message here being it's safe to support this. Not only uh, is it safe, people want it. Real quick, Sahal, then what is the timing of when we might actually see written text? Because that's what you need. That's the next step, right, that you need before this thing can actually move forward and get a vote. Right. It's always unclear in the Senate. You usually take the over rather than the under. But the goal is that they finish writing the bill this week, that Senator Chuck Schumer, the majority leader, can begin that process of clearing these cloture hoops by the end of this week, which would allow uh, for the senators to pass it next week. It usually takes a week uh, to process a bill like this in the Senate. That is the goal. Hallie. Sahil Kapoor, thank you. Some of President Biden's closest allies are making very clear, very publicly, that they are not thrilled about a controversial trip we just found out he's going to take next month to Saudi Arabia. He's set to meet with the country's leader, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Senator Tim Kaine, Democrat, reportedly calling this a bad idea, adding that, in his words, MBS's blood stain has not been cleansed. Remember, then-candidate Joe Biden called Saudi Arabia a pariah state when he was running for president because of the horrific murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Well, today, the State Department spokesperson, Ned Price, is saying the administration hasn't forgotten that, but they do also want to pursue U.S. interests in Saudi. Watch. We can have human rights at the center of our foreign policy, uh, as they have been, as we continue to pursue the interests of the American people across all of these interests and the many other interests uh, that we have and that we share uh, with our Saudi partners. Andrea Mitchell, our chief foreign affairs correspondent, is joining us for this now. Andrew, I'm glad to have you with us because, listen, this is a big pivot for President Biden, okay? But given that gas prices are above $5 a gallon, given the oil conversation that he's going to be having with Saudi Arabia. Um, was this somewhat inevitable for him? Yes, but also security issues. They yeah. have supported a ceasefire in Yemen in that horrific civil war. They're also critical in pushing back against Iran and its development of what is apparently uh, a nuclear program that now has no visibility to the world because they've now this week taken down the cameras that had been agreed to back in 2015 as part of that Iran nuclear deal. 
So now those UN cameras, the weapons inspectors, can't see what they're doing. So the world is blind to what they're doing, and this is a really big crisis point that's building for them. But of course, they say it's not oil, it's oil. And it's not clear that this trip will do anything. By the way, the White House announcing today, again releasing more oil from the petroleum, strategic, strategic petroleum reserves to try to bring those prices down. It hasn't had much effect so far, all to offset, of course, the oil that is not being exported by Russia because of Western sanctions, Hallie. The human rights component to this is super interesting and I think really important to talk about here. You've heard the criticism coming from the president's own party. And Andrea, you heard it directly, I know, from a Democratic senator on your show on a different network not too long ago. Um, the, the White House, the president has to confront MBS on human rights. No, I mean, that, that, is, that has got to be a part of this conversation here. Well, I don't think it will be confronting. I think it will be raising the issue diplomatically so he can check the box and say he's raised it. He's certainly not going to do what he said on our debate, the MSNBC debate back in 2019, is call them a pariah state. And as soon as he took office, he did something that Donald Trump, of course, refused to do because of his uh, incredible reliance on the Saudis for all kinds of things, including uh, allegedly private investment, which then materialized to his son-in-law, Jared Kushner within you know, weeks, really, of them leaving office. It was a $2 billion Saudi investment in Jared Kushner's private investment and another $1 billion in Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin. So that connection was so strong. Well, what Joe Biden did was declassify the CIA report that found Mohammed bin Salman, the de facto leader of Saudi Arabia, the controversial crown prince, uh, responsible for knowing, if not ordering, the assassination, the brutal assassination of Jamal Khashoggi, and also imprisoning many rights activists, including many prominent women in Saudi Arabia. So it's a huge issue of human rights, and the 9-11 families still blame Saudi Arabia for 9-11. They say that the government had nothing to do with it, but there were 15 of the 19 hijackers who were Saudi. So it is controversial, and this is a tough decision for Joe Biden who had taken such a strong stand on human rights. Andrea Mitchell, thank you so much. I'm glad to have you with us. Your um, expertise and analysis is always so valuable. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Hallie. Coming up, it is primary day. We've got reporters in South Carolina and Nevada, where former President Trump's influence is really being put to the test. Plus, a Russian court extending WNBA star Brittany Griner's detention yet again. What her team is doing to try to get her home safe. That's after the break. Stay with us. A former conservative federal judge who advised former Vice President Mike Pence is set to testify during Thursday's January 6th hearing, which is going to focus on the former president's pressure campaign on Mike Pence not to certify the legitimate 2020 election results. It comes after the committee threw a bit of a curveball today into their schedule. They were supposed to have a hearing tomorrow, right? We talked about it earlier this week on this show. We told you we'd, we'd air it for you. There is not going to be anything to air because instead of tomorrow morning, they're now pushing it to next week. A member of the panel says it's partly because of some of the technical issues with the videos the staff is producing. Another member of the panel says they just wanted to make the hearings more spaced out. But regardless, the committee, again, is trying to put in place this argument that they want to put Donald Trump at the center of what they have called basically an attempted coup against democracy. I want to bring in now NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Vitale. Ali, what's interesting is within the last couple of minutes, I think you've seen it, um, Congresswoman Liz Cheney has dropped... Do they call it a teaser vid? I don't know what like the kids call it these days, but like this thing, we don't even have it because it literally just happened as we were coming to you, previewing yeah. what this next hearing is going to be about. This pressure campaign on Mike Pence, the involvement of this um, sort of architect of the whole election fraud lie in the first place, John Eastman. Uh, tell us more yeah. about that and what else we can expect over the next, you know, 24, 48 hours here, especially with this postponement of hearing, hearing number three, I guess it was called. Yeah, technically hearing number three was supposed to be tomorrow. Now it's going to be hearing number four next week. I think the numbering system is going to be thrown off, but the committee says that's basically all that's being thrown off in these scheduling shifts. And what we did see in the last few minutes and what I was furiously typing out on my phone so I that see I could it. send to the network. I just saw your, your note. Inbox Thank now. you. Tell us about it. <laughs> Email in real time. The idea that Liz Cheney is teasing the, the fact that and pointing out that judge, a federal judge in the past has said that what 
Eastman did in pressuring Mike Pence has a likely criminal component to it. And then she plays in this video a piece of evidence that we've seen previously from Trump lawyer Eric Hirschman in which he says in part that he told John Eastman after the January 6th insurrection that Eastman needed to get a good criminal lawyer because he was going to need it, effectively showing that the idea that this could have been criminal was something that crept into the mindset of the former president's inner orbit, frankly, in real time on January 6th, and those lawyers who were part of the legal discussions around the fraud campaigns that the former president and his allies were trying to put up, people who were looking into those debunked ideas of fraud in the election, all of those people were aware that there could have been some criminal exposure here, and Liz Cheney saying the quiet part out loud, previewing Thursday's hearing of the pressure campaign against the former Vice President Mike Pence. You and I love to live in the weeds as political reporters. That's our day jobs. Yeah. I get it. Help me, uh, help us, help our viewers, help everybody sort of lift out of that, right? Because why this matters, it seems, is the piece that you have identified, and that is the potential criminality here, right? Which... Again, this, these hearings are not a court of law, right? This isn't a courtroom. Yeah. These are political hearings. Let's be clear about that. That said, there is this open question of whether the committee would move forward to refer any criminal activity that it uncovers evidence of to the Department of Justice. There has been some, let's see, multiple interpretations from even the committee members as to whether they have the authority to do that or will do that. Yeah. There have, and there have been competing mindsets on what the right path is going forward. I think the quickest way to elevate this out of the weeds is to say this is all about accountability. Congress can set the narrative, but that's kind of as far as it can go. They're going to write a report. They're going to potentially do some legislating. But all of this really falls to the Department of Justice when you're actually talking about criminal accountability. That's the larger out-of-the-weeds theme. Ali Vitale, live for us on Capitol Hill. Ali, um, emailing and talking on television and running through the halls. Thanks, Superwoman. Appreciate we do it, it. all. <laughs> right now, we are going to cover something totally different, right? And that is weather. When you talk about we do it all, we're covering it all because there is some dangerous heat all across the country today. This heat wave stretching from the upper Midwest to northern Florida, putting 105 million people at risk. It's going to be really hot and it's going to be really humid and it could be life threatening, right? This is serious stuff. We're also watching storms fueled by that heat, a derecho it seems, blew through Chicago overnight. That's basically a line of storms that travels more than 250 miles with winds of nearly 60 miles an hour. Out west, they've got more dramatic weather too. Flooding in Montana. Look at this video showing a house. Wow. That house just straight up collapsing into the Yellowstone River. Look at that. That flooding, right, all that rain is why Yellowstone National Park officials had to close all entrances. Kathy Park is following the extreme weather forest from Chicago. And Kathy, let me start where, where you are uh, with, with people in Chicago holding a news conference today. Officials there saying it is going to be so hot. You have to be careful. 109 degree heat index. It's not even summer yet, right? Technically, it's not summer for another week. Hallie, that's absolutely right. And I think it's important to note that heat is the number one weather related killer in the country and hundreds of people die each and every year due to heat related illnesses. And here in Chicago, an excessive heat warning is in effect until tomorrow night. And that's why city officials are encouraging people to take it easy during these conditions. If you do have to be outdoors in this humidity, take a lot of breaks. Remember to stay hydrated, find that AC as much as possible. Also, keep a close watch on vulnerable populations, those under two years old and elderly folks who are 65 and older, Hallie. Montana's Yellowstone Park is hundreds of miles away, right? But in a way, all of these weather disasters are connected, right? Talk about how some of these extremes are driven by climate change. Yeah, so Hallie, what is happening at Yellowstone is pretty extraordinary. So unprecedented rainfall coupled with snow melt on Sunday led to the extreme flooding. And you saw the images uh, when you were introducing the segment of the water just swallowing bridges and even roadways and stranding some visitors inside the park. And scientists, yes, are blaming climate change on this disaster because extreme flooding like this is becoming more and more frequent. Hallie. Kathy Park, live for us in Chicago. Kathy, thank you. So a Russian court has extended basketball star Brittany Griner's detention until at least July 2nd, right? So for another few weeks. You know Griner's been held in Russia since February. Russian officials say they found vape cartridges with a cannabis derivative in her bag. The State Department says she's being wrongfully held there. This news was coming just a day after her Phoenix Mercury teammates and coaches met with the State Department 
and members of Congress who are working to get her out. Knowing that the State Department and, you know, pretty much the whole world is on this, I think gives us a lot of confidence knowing that they're working on it and, you know, anything that we can do on our side to, to amplify and to put BG first is, is going to be our number one priority. Emily Akata is joining me now with more. And you heard it there, Emily. They feel somewhat hopeful, right? I would say maybe cautiously optimistic that Griner will get out because the eyes of the world are watching Russia and watching her right now. Yeah, absolutely. But I will say that I think today's development, you can imagine it a disheartening one in that her detainment is being extended. It appears to have becoming as a bit of a surprise. The U.S. State Department say that they found out the same way we did through a Russian news media report earlier today. This all comes, as you mentioned, just one day after Griner's teammates on the Phoenix Mercury met with U.S. officials to discuss uh, her hopeful potential release. And they say that it boosted their confidence in that uh, their belief that the, they will be able to bring her home swiftly and safely. But again, after today's announcement, we haven't been able to get a hold of the Phoenix Mercury. But here is what the U.S. State Department is saying earlier this afternoon in terms of their latest efforts. Take a listen. This case is problematic from top to bottom. Uh, it is precisely why we have characterized Brittany Griner as a uh, wrongful detainee. It's precisely why uh, we are doing everything we can uh, to see and to affect uh, her prompt release from Russian detention. And this is the third time the Russian court has extended Griner's detainment. This time around, we'll keep her in Russian custody for at least another 18 days, Hallie. You talk about Russia, uh, you talk about Americans who are in Russian detainment. You have to think about not just Brittany Griner, but Paul Whelan, who is also being held there. And then, of course, Trevor Reed, who, Emily, you well know, and viewers of this show will know, was freed in a prisoner exchange after he was there for more than three years. He is now saying today that he is filing a petition with the U.N. declaring that Russia violated international law because he was so poor treated while he was detained and from his detention period. What's the hope? What's the, what does Trevor Reed hope that outcome will be? Well, now he's been home for more than 40 days, and so he is calling on the United Nations to start the process of holding Russia accountable for his detainment. He also wants the U.N. to demand that Russia compensate him for violation of his rights. In this 13,000-word petition, he talks about his experience in Russian custody. He talks about uh, the horrific living conditions, malnutrition, abuse that he sustained for several years. He's hoping that if the U.N. takes action against Russia, it will deter the country from them doing the same or repeating what he faced and hopefully uh, prompt Russia for a more uh, easily, more easy release of Brittany Griner and Paul Whelan. Howie. Emily Akata, glad that you're standing on top of this story for us. Thank you so much. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, Coinbase, a crypto exchange, says it's going to cut 18 percent of its workforce. Listen, that's like 1,100 jobs. The company's CEO points to what we talked about earlier in the show, a potential recession for the cuts, says this will help the burn rate and efficiency for the company. Coinbase's shares are down 79% this year. Number two, two American Airlines-owned regional characters are gonna hike what they pay pilots by 50% until the end of August, 2024. It means that pilots at Texas-based Envoy Air and Piedmont Airlines out of Maryland will be the highest paid pilots out of any of the regional airlines. The carriers are hoping that's gonna help with the whole pilot shortage crisis we've talked about. Number three, a new study finding more than 14% of the world's population has probably had Lyme disease. You know, it's the most common disease that you can get from a tick in Europe and North America. Lyme disease is not often deadly, but it can still make people really sick. Number four, Serena Williams getting a wild card to be able to play at Wimbledon this year. She was one of six women given a spot in the singles draw earlier today. It's going to be the first time she's played anywhere since she got hurt last year. We will be watching. Number five, Netflix says it's staging its own real life Squid Game reality show with the biggest cash prize in reality TV history. And can I just say, if you watch the show, which I did through my hands, peeking through my fingers, that is, that is some banana stuff right there. It's called Squid Game The Challenge. 456 players will be in this real life game to try to win $4.56 million. Um, you know, their marketing is like who emerges the sole survivor. People will let like people will be okay. Everyone should be leaving the show unscathed, they say. Let's hope so. I don't even how do you, what? That's gonna be as we speak.
Voters in five states are at the ballot box with the future of the Republican Party on the line and the Trump endorsement being put to the test yet again. In South Carolina, we're watching a couple of really important House races where the former president is on what, what one of these um, competitors called to me the, his purge tour, if you will. He's actively trying to push out people like the woman you see on your screen, Congresswoman Nancy Mace. She has publicly said she wanted to hold Donald Trump accountable after January 6th, but since then, She's gone pretty silent with any intense criticism since he endorsed her primary opponent, right, the other Republican in that race. Then there's Congressman Tom Rice, who voted to impeach Donald Trump after the insurrection and has kept up criticizing him, unlike Mace. Then out west in Nevada, we're watching a couple of key races, the GOP Senate and gubernatorial primaries, where Trump-backed candidates are favored to win tonight and take on incumbent Democrats in the fall. Joining me now, Vaughn Hilliard and Guad Venegas. Vaughn, east in South Carolina, Guad west uh, in in Nevada. West Coast, Best Coast squads, I'm going to save you for last. Let me start with you, Vaughn, and Nancy Mace here. A Trump backer since day one, um, but doesn't have the Trump endorsement. Uh, the day after he endorsed her opponent, right, she records this video in front of Trump Tower talking about how she's always supported the president. Um, that said, obviously, her impeachment vote speaks for itself. How has the non-endorsement affected her campaign? Yeah, I think it was a recognition by Nancy Mace here when the former president rolls into South Carolina, into her backyard, and goes onto the campaign trail, the stump for Katie Arrington, yep. the candidate running in the primary against her. It's a recognition by her that perhaps Donald Trump was still popular in this district. And that is where you have seen this right turn. You know, it was one year ago just 11 days after the insurrection when she said that the Republican Party needed to rebuild itself, needed to go through a reconciliation process. She directly said Donald Trump put members of Congress in harm's way on January 6th. But when I caught up with her yesterday, she's doing her best to avoid talking about him altogether and instead focusing on those issues like inflation and gas prices, the issues that she believes she can connect with voters on here. You know, at the same time, uh, you know, you've got a, a, a reality that, uh, you know, this is a Republican Party that is still very much dominated uh, by Donald Trump's influence. And the question is, can she beat back uh, the primary challenge in that endorsement, endorsed candidate of Donald Trump? Then there's Tom Rice, right? I spoke with him earlier this afternoon, who, um, and he was very clear. He feels pretty confident about his chances here um, tonight in this primary race, even though he's up against somebody who also has a endorsement from Donald Trump. Watch. What is your level of confidence that you can win this race today without the support of the de facto leader of your party in Donald Trump? I don't think Donald Trump is the de facto leader of our party. Uh, I, Why not? Uh, I, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic I'll, I'll win this. What's interesting here is Rice is, um, hasn't backed off his criticisms of Donald Trump, even though, you know, the polls are what they are here. Right, and he's kind of a lone soldier, Hallie, if I may, in this Republican Party. Outside of Liz Cheney, who is running her for her own reelection bid this August in Wyoming, there's a lot of Republicans that have spoken out against Donald Trump, but they've since announced retirements. A good number of senators, some House members who announced uh, that they voted to impeach him, like Adam Kinzinger. And that's where Tom Rice is sort of this unusual character here, also facing a Trump backed candidate, trying to run and win while still denouncing Donald Trump. Take a listen, though, to a few of the voters here I talked to here in Nancy May. District who are weighing Donald Trump's influence and in, in, in this. To what extent did Trump's endorsement impact your decision in this race? None. 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 You voted for? I voted for Nancy. Who did you go with? Katie Arrington. Why? Um, because she's not Nancy Mace. She tried to not be as critical recently. But did we, that change? We still remember. We still remember. Mm -hmm. As Tom Rice called it, Hallie, it's a purge campaign by Donald Trump. Right. The question here in South Carolina, will he win one of these races, two of these races? That's what we're going to be looking at tonight. I would look forward to talking with you tomorrow, Vaughn, when we have um, potentially some of the results of that, those races. Appreciate it. Thanks, pal. Guad Venegas, your turn in Nevada out there. Um, you've been following these Nevada campaigns closely. It's all led to today. We got pictures of both of the Trump-backed candidates voting today, the Senate candidate, Adam Laxalt, the candidate for governor, Joe Lombardo. You've been talking with GOP voters. Tell me what you've heard. 
Uh, Hallie, well, the voters that are voting for the Republican candidates here today are upset. They want change. They're upset because of the economy, inflation, gas prices, the cost of housing. These are the things they keep repeating. So they all come up here and they say they want change. They're not happy with the current leadership. Uh, yet when it comes to that Senate race, which is a big deal, national implications, Republicans think this can be the 51st seat in the Senate. When it comes to that race, they are somewhat divided here, the ones I've spoken to, some preferring Adam Laxalt, who's the Trump-endorsed candidate, and others saying that Sam Brown would be a better candidate to represent them in the U.S. Senate. Let's hear from two different voters who spoke to me earlier today. I've done a lot of research on Adam Laxalt. I like what he had done in the past as the Attorney General, and I, uh, I'm hopeful and looking forward to what he can do. Sam Brown. For sure, Sam Brown. He's, um, he's one of us. He, um, he stands for everything that I do, or I stand for everything he does. So at the moment, the latest poll uh, does indicate that Adam Laxalt has a 14-point lead over Sam Brown. Uh, his campaign said that that's within the margin of error. We'll have to wait and see what happens tomorrow and see who will face off with uh, Catherine Cortez Masto. Quad Venegas, thank you. Good to see you in Nevada. And again, we'll pre-book you for tomorrow too, friend. Thank you. Appreciate it. When we come back, it is scary easy to buy drugs online. Our backstory tonight, all about how somebody can get those potentially deadly drugs with nothing more than a smartphone and a social media account. Kate Snow joins us next. Time now to get the backstory, our behind the scenes look at how a story comes together and how it fits into our bigger picture. And not too long ago, our own Kate Snow looked into just how easy it is to buy potentially deadly drugs on social media. The Schmill family lost their daughter Becca in 2020 at 18 years old to drugs. Drugs, her parents say, that Becca got by using various social media channels to reach dealers. Didn't realize just how um, easy it was for her to have drugs delivered basically to our door. How easy was it? Um, just it happened like calling an Uber. Our daughter is the consequence. And how many more Beckas, you know, are there before those in control take responsibility for this? NBC News talked with an advocate with the nonprofit group Coalition for a Safer Web, who set up an Instagram account to purposefully follow drug dealers and other bad actors. And if you know what emojis to look for, it can be easy to find drug content. Among the feed that Kate looked at, you see her there? All kinds of drug offers, right? Advertisements from everything from exercise equipments to movies. Instagram did say it offers advertisers tools to keep ads from running alongside certain types of content. And by the way, the sale of illegal drugs is technically prohibited on both Instagram and Snapchat. Both platforms say they're working on technology to shut down dealer accounts. Kate Snow is joining us now to talk about this. And I'm so glad you're here, Kate, because this is yeah. a story that is, you know, surprising and sad, right? How did you meet Becca's family? How did you go about telling their story and, and getting them to open up to you about yeah. this really, really, obviously, horrifically traumatic moment in their lives? You know, it's funny. I just, someone just stopped me in the hallway, yeah. Hallie. A fellow mom who works here was like, oh my God, that story this morning. Um, I think this hits every parent really hard when you see a story like Becca's. She was a great kid. Um, doing all the right things and she you know she went down a path that her parents really weren't aware of fully anyway um, how did we find them actually through the second person that you just showed Eric Feinberg who works for coalition for a safer web they made the introduction um, to Becca's family and when we heard that they had some of the direct messages that Becca had sent to alleged drug dealers back before she died. That's why we thought we should profile this family. I've done a lot of stories, unfortunately, Hallie, about children who've been lost to fentanyl because it is so deadly. Yeah. I think everyone knows that now, but if you don't, please, for the love of God, make sure you don't go anywhere near fentanyl. But what's happening is people are getting it by accident, which is what happened to Becca. And again, she was able to get it through DMing on Snapchat in her case. I know you've um, talked public. I can't remember if Kate, I saw it on your Instagram or, or somewhere that you were sort of surprised that there were these like mainstream advertisements right yeah. next to drug content basically on yeah. these feeds. I want to be really clear about that. So you're looking at it on the left side of your yeah. screen. So basically he set up, this is Eric Feinberg with Coalition for a Safer Web. He set up an Instagram account, a, a, you know, a, 
not real person Instagram account. Uh, he used a mannequin as his profile pic, Hallie. Okay. Got he it. set it up to follow nefarious he, intentionally. Actors. He intentionally, intentionally did it to like try He's to see what's happening. Intentionally yes. trying yes. to find drugs, guns, all kinds of nefarious stuff because he, he wants to study that. So we were focused on the on the drug content. So he then ends up with tons of drug content coming at him because he keeps following more and more people mm. who are alleged drug dealers. And and so his feed is filled with picture after picture of of drug content. Now Instagram said to us that may not be representative of what a real person is experiencing, which I uh, complete, completely understand. But at the same time, if you are a person who has a substance abuse issue, you may be doing the same thing that Eric did, which is following people yeah. who will provide drugs for you. And what you're seeing around the drug content is advertising, which is a separate issue, right? The advertisers buy in bulk on Instagram. They don't necessarily know where their content, where their ads are appearing. Um, certainly, I don't think Peloton wants their ads to be appearing around illicit drug content. Um, they did not respond to our request for comment, and neither did uh, the other two that you showed, Disney and NBC Universal, our own parent company, uh, whose, whose ad we showed. They didn't respond to our request for comment, but, but the point is that the Schmills would tell you, Hallie, that because there's advertising content around the feeds of drug content, it sort of normalizes everything. Hmm. It's, this whole, it's this whole ecosystem that makes it to young people maybe seem okay that this is what's happening, that they're, right. that they're buying illegal drugs. Like if it's just out there on Instagram. You know, I mean, Kate, you, you do do so much in this, in this area of looking at, you know, the safety of kids online. Was there some? What's your? What's the thing that stands out to you most from this story and this family? Right, aside from the advertisements that we talked about. What's the thing that, like, when you're talking this weekend and telling your friends, "This is what I did this week at work," that you're telling them? Well, you know what I'm doing is I'm talking to my kids. I have a 16 uh, and a 19 year old Hallie, and I can't tell you how many times we've had the fentanyl talk at this point. Don't take anything that didn't come from a pharmacy, people. Don't don't trust that something that someone hands to you and says is a Xanax really is a Xanax. It might be filled with fentanyl, and one pill, literally one pill, can kill you. So that's one thing. Um, but as a parent, I, my heart went out to the Schmills. I, I felt you know, terribly for what they've been through. I also think it's this parents being in the dark and we don't mm. know the code language. Today.com has a great piece up now, Hallie, um, that you can find based off my piece this morning, uh, which was first aired on Today. But their piece looks at the language and the emojis that kids are using that we don't even know. Yeah. Like we parents don't understand, we adults don't necessarily understand that a plug emoji, for example, means I will hook you up with drugs. That's what a plug emoji means. So if you see your kid texting plugs, you just might want to have a conversation. It's so important to know, so important to think about. Kate Snow, yeah. um, I'm so glad you're able to join us. Thank you very much for pulling back the Actually. curtain and explaining how this all came together. Appreciate it. Coming up here on the show, we're going to take you inside a migrant shelter in Texas that's set to shut down next month. What happens now to the thousands of people who've come through its doors? We've got that in the original next. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. From our West Coast Bureau, officials in California say a military veteran was arrested today after he shot a California Highway Patrol officer during a traffic stop in L.A. last night. The CHP says there was some kind of a fight. The officer was shot multiple times. He's now listed in critical condition. From our Midwest Bureau, Oklahoma City Police arrested an anti-abortion activist today after he scaled the city's biggest, tallest building. That's it right there. They took him into custody at the top of Devon Tower. Last month, this same person reportedly climbed the New York Times building in Manhattan and the Salesforce Tower in San Francisco, too. From our New York Bureau, the state's top court says Happy the Elephant is not a person and will not be released from the Bronx Zoo. Do you remember we told you about this story a little while ago? An animal advocacy group had argued the elephant was being illegally detained at the zoo in a case that raised ethical questions about the rights of highly intelligent animals. But again, happy will stay where happy is. So tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been keeping an eye on. And tonight, a lot of consequences could come with lifting Title 42, that public health order that has blocked nearly 2 million asylum seekers from crossing the border since the start of the pandemic. Ruben Garcia, the director of a network of migrant shelters in the El Paso area, says his sites are often full. And since there's not enough volunteers, 
He says he'll be forced to shut down one of his biggest shelters by the end of the July. He says he thinks the federal government's immigration system is too dependent on non-governmental organizations like his. NBC's Julia Ainsley has the latest. We're inside a migrant shelter in El Paso, Texas, where hundreds of migrants are taking refuge after crossing the U.S.-Mexico border. From here, they will travel into the U.S. to pursue their immigration cases. You've got New York, Massachusetts, New Jersey, gosh, all over Ohio, Florida. This is all over the country. Correct. Ruben Garcia runs Annunciation House, a network of shelters in the El Paso area where he says up to 650 migrants can stay while they arrange for transportation further into the U.S. The federal government depends on shelters like his to take in migrants who might otherwise end up on the streets. I give Border Patrol and ICE an idea of how many available cots we have for the next days. Garcia is worried about what will happen when COVID-19 border restrictions, known as Title 42, eventually lift and is calling on the Biden administration to step in. There are thousands of people that have gathered on the Mexican side of the border that are waiting for Title 42. It's going to look, I think, chaotic, and it doesn't have to be that way. Garcia says Border Patrol often has more migrants to release than he has space to take in. I, I think the federal government is very dependent on the NGO network across the entire border area. He worries because the shelter we're touring now is scheduled to shut down at the end of July. Since COVID, it's become very challenging to find the volunteers to help staff facilities that are this large. Peter Jaquez, the deputy chief of Border Patrol in the area, says they send as many migrants as Garcia can take. We do maximize using uh, Ruben Garcia because he does tremendous work. He says he has alternatives, like sending migrants to other border sectors. We have flights that will take them to a detention center in another city. We have flights that will take pe people to another processing center on the southwest border. Back inside the shelter, we meet children playing soccer and riding scooters, eager to see what life in America has in store for them. And Garcia introduced us to two women, Jimena and Alexandra, who asked us to conceal their full identities because they're afraid of the gangs they fled in Colombia. She says that, that they started asking for extortion money for, for the boy. The father wasn't able to pay for it, that the father was disappeared. For now, Garcia is continuing to help the migrants in his care. He offered to pay for these women to travel to Chicago and New York. Julia is joining us now live. Julia, I'm, I'm glad you're with us to talk about your reporting. What are the plans, right, for when places like these shut down to actually shelter some of these migrants? Well, it's interesting. We also started reporting that we've, we've heard, because we obtained internal DHS documents, that there are plans to take migrants from overcrowded cities, potentially El Paso being one of them, and send them further into the U.S. to another shelter networks, like in places like Houston, Dallas, Albuquerque, and actually starting with L.A., Hallie. But that takes planning, and people have spoken to say, look, what's easiest is to use the resources that are right there at the border. But NGOs across the country, those are those non governmental organizations like Ruben Garcia's, they depend on volunteers. And since the start of the pandemic, they've had fewer and fewer volunteers, especially because so many of them may be elderly, retirees, people who would be really impacted if they came in close contact with the virus. And so now Ruben's looking for other locations. He does hope that the federal government will increase its response, increase its planning so that migrants aren't so dependent on shelters like his and that they do get the care that they need before they go on to their final destinations to pursue their immigration cases, Hallie. Julia Ainsley, thank you very much for being with us. Still to come, we've got more from Savannah Guthrie's exclusive interview with Amber Heard, who says she is standing by every word of her testimony. We've got more on that when we come back. In an exclusive interview with Savannah this morning on the Today Show, Amber Heard says she has so much regret for what happened during her relationship with ex-husband Johnny Depp after the verdict in their defamation trial. The actress also acknowledging she did do and say horrible, regrettable things throughout their relationship. Listen. And it was ugly and could be very beautiful. It was very, very toxic. We were awful to each other. You know, I made a lot of a lot of mistakes, a lot of mistakes, but I've always told the truth. 
Remember, Depp sued her for $50 million after she described herself as a public figure representing domestic abuse in a 2018 Washington Post op-ed. She didn't name Depp in that piece. Heard then countersued for $100 million, claiming Depp's former lawyer defamed her when he called her claims of abuse a hoax. A jury ultimately ruled more for Depp than for Heard after finding clear and convincing evidence that she defamed him. Our Danny Savalos joins us now. Okay, Danny, so Heard says she stands by every word of her testimony. Her lawyers say they plan to appeal. How does this interview, with wearing your like, legal beagle hat, how does this interview help or hurt her? It does neither, and here's okay. why. When you appeal, the record is essentially set in stone. So the only thing the court's going to look at is exhibits that were actually admitted into evidence and trial testimony, the actual transcripts. If, for example, Depp's team tried to introduce evidence of this post-trial interview, then Heard's team would simply argue, and the court would likely conclude that that's not part of the record. So we're not going to consider that, even if it is completely damaging to Amber Heard. It's just not part of the record. And that's what the appellate court is confined to. They stick to the four corners of what the jury and the judge saw. And that's it. So what would the grounds be for an appeal for her? There are a couple uh, possibilities. One is the judge's refusal to let in medical records that Amber Heard's team wanted in, particularly uh, psycho psychologist records, which may have shown that she was reporting this abuse to, to a third party, to somebody else, and thereby it would give a little more uh, truth to her allegations. And uh, there may be some other issues for appeal, but right now that seems to be the biggest one with the best chance. But uh, here's the thing. Uh, when judges decide to admit evidence or exclude evidence, uh, appellate court judges give those lower court judges great deference. It's only if they abuse their authority generally that the appellate court will even consider uh, overturning a jury's verdict based on evidence that came in or didn't come in. Danny Savalos, good to see you. Thanks so much. Savannah Guthrie is going to have more of that conversation, including how Heard feels about Johnny Depp now, tomorrow on the Today Show. And you'll see even more during a special edition of Dateline, Friday night, 8 o'clock Eastern. That does it for us this hour. We're going to have more for you here tomorrow, same time, same place. Coverage picks up right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.